<laughs> Thank you. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, you know, this, uh, I'm Dr. Dobzhansky. I teach uh, piano and chamber music and piano literature and uh, anything piano related uh, at Kansas State University, which is in Manhattan, Kansas, about four and a half hours from St. Louis going west. <laughs> um, this presentation was um, Actually, the first time I um, presented on this topic was for our local association here in Manhattan. And um, the um, um, one of uh, the piano teachers was later our state conference chair. And so she was very interested in me talking about this topic to the, for the state conference. So I did that. And then that state conference was online because of the pandemic. So someone from Missouri, I think you, Butler has seen that, so she was then interested uh, in me sharing it all with you. So that's a kind of it has a kind of a story here, and um, so um, except for the conference, the uh, the length of the presentation was about fifty minutes, and here you know we have expanded a little longer. So I hope that I will make it to ninety minutes, but maybe not. We'll see. Um. So okay now. Um, um, well, you know, so the topic of competitions, how did they actually evolve and, you know, uh, what is the story of music competitions? That's an interesting topic. The, the topic of competitions has so many sides and so many aspects um, that actually, if you think about it longer, it can be a topic for a conference itself, you know, actually. And so, the oldest music competitions, um, the oldest um, is the Naumburg piano competition. Um, and, you know, we all think about, you know, how did that all evolve? You know, even in ancient times, there were competitions, you know, for poets and the poets usually were singing, not really reciting. So in some ways, the ancient competitions in ancient Greece or Mesopotamia, they were actually already music competitions. Um, so, historically for pianists, it's good to remember that Naumburg is the oldest, and, um, but with competitions, it's kind of interesting because some of them become more important, some of them kind of get forgotten a little bit and lost, lose prestige. It actually depends who are the winners and what happens to the winners. Let's say if you look at the second uh, on the list, which is the Chopin International Piano Competition in Warsaw. Well, we have Martha Arherich, one of the winners. And so that um, automatically increases the prestige of the competition. So that competition becomes more and more recognized in the world. Um, Queen Elizabeth Tchaikovsky competition. Um, it, I didn't know that until this morning that Yes, we all know that Van Kleiber won the Tchaikovsky competition and it was this big deal during the Cold War, but actually that he won the very first Tchaikovsky competition and that also adds to the, you know, to the um, uh, importance of this historical event, right? And then, of course, he himself established the Van Kleiber, which um, is a very important competition for pianists. Um, and, um, Many of these competitions, like Queen Elizabeth, Geneva, Leeds, they actually not entirely piano competitions. Uh, they change the category, you know, every two years it's for violin or voice, you know, so that, you know, from Geneva, we have all these famous violin, um, violinists who won. Um, and then I started looking up, you know, some statistics about um, how many competitions there were. You know, it's actually top, a topic that is not well researched. So I was able to find out that in 1945, there were only five piano competitions, which kind of is, well, first of all, it's after the war. So how many competitions can you have? But 114 in 1990 <clears throat> and currently, which was in 2010, there were 750 piano competitions. And of course, because of the pandemic, and you know, there, there were so many new online competitions that probably we go now into 1500 
uh, <clears throat> piano competitions. And you, of course, counting is a complicated matter. How do you count and which competitions you actually count? Are these competitions international and so on? So this statistic is, um, is we, we don't know how they were counting. We would need to look up the article, uh, but um, we know that there's more and more competitions and we all get in our mailboxes, we get more and more you know, invitations for our students to participate. Um, another topic that, you know, um, very often, you know, the students have to learn biographies of great composers and they have to kind of, you know, so we read, um, Ravel got a gold medal in piano from Paris Conservatory. And so what is it? Was he the only person who graduated that year? Right, it's a very legitimate question. So the gold medal um, at conservatories worked as um, the Royal Conservatory examinations, you know, that many students get the gold medal standard. So there were several gold medals, but very often we misunderstand this information. Ravel was the best pianist that year he got the gold medal at the Tchaikovsky Conservatory. It's not quite correct. He just graduated, you know, with the best mark. The gold medal today is called uh, the first prize in France. So that's it, they changed it. But uh, it's also misleading. He got the first prize this year. But there were also other people that got the first prize. So it's not really the first prize okay, in that sense. Um, well, <clears throat> I wonder what is the next slide? Oh, uh, okay, here. Um, well, you know, um, we all read um, <clears throat> um, a book about a pianist by Harold Schoenberg, and you know, there were all these um, anecdotes about pianists and, you know, some of them in competition situations. So there were several competitions. I, I was only aware of this one and the one between Clementi and Mozart, but I researched a little longer since this presentation is longer than the ones that I gave before. So um, <clears throat> the first one between two keyboard players, historically, was between Handel and Scarlatti. You can read the story. There are two versions here, who won on what and uh, the, the host was the card, a cardinal in Rome because Handel went to Italy, to Italy being the capital, the center of music at the time, to study more about opera and so on. And supposedly he met with Scarlatti and they had a pianistic duel. Okay, so um, Handel supposedly won on the organ. Scarlatti was better on harpsichord. What is the other story here? Yes, Scarlatti recognized his rival superiority on the organ, but the listeners were divided on the outcome of the harpsichord. Okay. And um, <clears throat> very often it's interesting what happens after the competition. Sometimes these two musicians never talk again. It's really kind of funny as to, to be aware of these little uh, things. Okay, so there is about more and more duels here that I collected for you. Um, I was not aware of this one at all until uh, maybe three days ago. Uh, it's a, about um, someone from France that we barely know today, actually, as pianist, <clears throat> who traveled to uh, Germany to, to um, kind of fight, uh, I mean, to meet Bach in a duel, but um, and supposedly he heard Bach play and he just got so scared of, of the level of playing that he just left and actually there was no duel in that sense. Um, um, so, and that's the time before Bach moved to Leipzig. So, um, 1717, okay, so we have Beethoven, however, okay, there's the famous one. And that one, we know lots of details about this meeting. This was, of course, Clementi was, the, you know, we all repeat Clementi invented the piano sonata. We, well, we all teach Clementi also, right? So, that's it. so they I met um, in front of the emperor and, um, 
and this, there's lots of detail here, you know, and there was a certain procedure, you know, of the, um, the certain procedure was followed, like, um, first they had to present their solo pieces, then the emperor would give them a melody to improvise on, and so on. So you can, I will not be reading the description of the events here because you can read it, but the outcome was that, um, uh, what did the emperor say here? Emperor, um, um, we, we only remember the following, that Mozart did not like Clementi's playing. He said Clementi played like a machine. <clears throat> it's actually, it's, uh, it says here, uh, like a robot. That's what Mozart said about Clementi, unfortunately. But uh, Clementi left a description of Mozart playing as someone who I have never heard someone play with such spirit and grace. And that is a very important cue for us about, you know, Mozart's style. So that is much more important of what was the actually the outcome of the competition. Um, let's just move on. Okay, there were, I think, three duels in which Beethoven <laughs> took play. Beethoven, oh, I think, piano. Uh, where is that piano sound coming from? Okay. Um, well, uh, okay. Um, one person was Joseph Wolf, and, you know, he, um, it looks like he was an arrogant uh, young man, and, you know, Beethoven had his own particular way of playing the piano with a lot of dynamics and a lot of pedal, and it actually had a kind of a scary, uh, you know, a, a impression on people. And people have never heard anything like this coming out of the piano. So uh, people very often uh, were shocked to hear uh, someone playing the piano in this particular way. Um, so let, there's one with this one is the most famous duel in which Beethoven participated and in, uh, Beethoven won all his duels. So that is because of his particular, extremely expressive way of playing. Beethoven was always the victor. But here, you know, the, there were certain conventions, you know, um, about these particular duels. You know, first they were supposed to uh, play their solo pieces, whatever they wanted to play. The second round was uh, alternating improvisations. So, um, and then you have a description of what happened next. Um, uh, right, and then at the end, they even had a, you know, kind of a final where they played chamber music. So it's kind of interesting. You can um, read the descriptions. There is one more here with Galinek. Galinek got completely shocked by Beethoven's playing. Um, one very famous duel, um, and this is, I think, the last one, was between Liszt and Thalberg. Thalberg was, uh, I think, Liszt's uh, most serious rival in Europe at that time, in 1830s. So they met in Paris, at the in palace of a princess. Um, her name was uh, Bello Gioio, and we have exact description who played what pieces and you know we know that Thalberg was particularly good at uh, pretending there was a, almost like forehand piano or you know one voice in the middle and all kinds of gimmicks and you know kind of a circus performer but um, so um, um, somehow in, you know even though he was less equal and wrote so much um, piano music, Thalberg is less known today in terms of his compositions are kind of not performed very often. Um, so, now is the real topic of, the, <clears throat> of my presentation. <clears throat> so, my uh, personal experience, um, I have judged in uh, all states around Kansas, um, and many MTNA competitions state competitions, duet competitions. We have a Kansas High School Activities Association, which has um, uh, district and state level. I judged the Chopin Foundation a competition in Seattle, 
And you know, Chopin Foundation is located in Miami, but they have um, um, kind of branches. So that's a very serious competition. I was twice the judge at the international competition in Seattle, which, um, well, is part of the you know, organization of international piano competitions. Um, I judged one duet competition in Poland. Uh, we you know, also judges from all the different countries. Um, and all kinds of small festivals in small towns in Kansas, but also one in Seattle, one, oh, sorry, concerto competition in Wichita, um, and then one competition in Beijing, China. Um, and, you know, I was in many different situations. I was the one judge or two judges, which can be tricky when there are two judges and they have different, different opinions. Or even as a panel of judges, so these are all different situations, and you're dealing with um, all kinds of different issues depending on the situation. Um, okay, next one. Okay, well, um, well, we need to talk about what are the disadvantages of competitions um, because um, there are some. Okay, and I'm trying to move uh, your. I wonder, okay, if I can, oh yes, great, I, now I cannot see you, but I can see the text. So, uh, the first disadvantage is um, that students and parents are taught to prioritize winning a competition over musical growth, and that is a kind of a real issue, because uh, the students are becoming interested only in winning, and so, how, how do I play this piece in order to win a competition? It's not a particularly musical, um, musical question that, you know, um, we kind of don't like that question. How do I play to win? Okay. Um, and then uh, the next question or the next issue that comes is, uh, well, I, I will only focus on the competition. This does not go to my competition, so I practice this less. And you know, I, but it might be a very important piece for your technical musical development. But you know, so only pieces that go to a competition get to be practiced. And so that's <laughs> right. Um, Next thing that comes is, well, uh, everybody wants to play the most difficult pieces immediately, right? Because the perception is the most difficult pieces win competitions. And that's something that is a challenge for the judges. We will talk about it in a second. Um, so um, very often uh, we are, as judges, in a situation where the student, if they only played something easier, they would have a chance at winning. But because they're not ready for a Mozart sonata, and they were given the Mozart sonata because it's a difficult repertoire, and they're not playing as well as they could at the real level. That is a real challenge. Next thing is, um, well, um, the, in the teachers, many teachers specialize in winning competitions. You know, so that's a, also a, kind of a, a trend, I would say, which can be uh, problematic. Right? And we have to, I think, we have to understand piano lessons are not about competitions, and um, but um, you know. Um, um, people will even quit studying with a given teachers because some other teacher students win competitions and they will go. So, you know, um, that we need to study with someone whose students win competitions, um, I don't know. We can, that's a topic to discuss, right? Um, another tendency among young students, okay, the faster I play, the likelihood of me winning is much bigger. Well, it's a kind of wrong perception. I need to play fast and, you know, so. Um, and of course, the last one here, um, that um, competitions focus on the idea of perfection, but instead they, they end up promoting a certain kind of uniformity. And that, that 
uh, can happen with these large competitions, you know, where um, we all know that a given person um, usually plays one composer excellently, but the other composers may be just fine. Or, so we end up, we have to kind of come to an average. And so we end up with winners who play everything very well, but those who play this one excellent, amazing, unforgettable Chopin Nocturne, that person was eliminated in the third at the third stage. And you know, that is a disappointment. Um, of, because um, that we all are after that one, that special moment in music, right? So um, art competitions that way, just missing what's, what really matters, you know, that's a, another topic that uh, should be discussed and considered. Okay, disadvantages. Um, Okay, now uh, what happens during a competition? Um, there are two sides to a competition, the judges and the organizers. Okay. And so um, a successful competition is where the um, organizer really knows the rules very well because um, judges are usually very busy, you know, um, um, thinking about the music and, you know, about giving the feedback and so um, uh, there were um, in one of the competitions, I, you know, it, this was a kind of a disturbing moment. What happens when the judge knows the rules better than the organizer? And what do the other judges think about that? That, that is kind of, and uh, so um, that moment was um, kind of, I had that moment uh, and we were all thinking, what does, what is the, agenda here that the judge is so familiar with the, you know and so it's kind of a suspicious moment um judges don't like to be overburdened with rules you know because uh there's so much they you know they want to i think they feel like teachers a little bit you know and they want to write the good feedback um irregularities happen i i had a um one con i was the only judge and one student let's say they play a different repertoire but they played it very well you know so uh so i was given a form that says schubert someone shows up plays the vc but very well <laughs> and you know this is a high school contest this is not an international competition so, <laughs> so so i have to ask the organizer organizer is scared to help me right so uh there are you know so and as a judge, you know, judges, you know, to be honest, they all like being judges and because it's kind of a recognition and so an honor. So they, uh, they do want to be invited again. So they don't want to be troublemakers for the organizer. There is a little bit kind of a, um, does this mean that they will overlook something? It can happen because they, um, they are invited to judge and not comment on the rules. Okay, for them, the host is the authority that establishes the rules. So um, this is a kind of a tricky situation. Um, uh, okay, very often, uh, you know, the judges are told um, that, you know, um, they should not be talking to each other, but even uh, facial expressions or a sigh, it's kind of already communicates. Oh, I don't like, oh, Oh, this, you know, so we should be basically watching our facial expressions and any kind of comments, even one word can influence someone else's thinking. <clears throat> so, um, another topic, um, well, as we all know, uh, piano, the piano literature is huge, it's immense, you know, and so it's not possible for the judges to know every single composition for the piano. Um, so how do we judge compositions that we don't know? Okay. And you know, there is a different level of, of familiarity. Let's say a uh, Chopin ballad that I've been playing for 30 years. Okay, I know that piece. I can really say I know that piece after 30 years of playing it. Um, is not necessarily a good thing, actually, because 
I have an opinion about every single note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now I can be very close minded, open minded, and I have too much to say immediately. And so my writing becomes, you know, you can't even read what I wrote. So, um, so that's one level of familiarity. Other level is, well, I taught this piece a few times. Okay, and so I'm kind of, and I taught this piece to uh, three, four different people, and they all different, and they all played it differently. So I have an appreciation for various possibilities. Okay, other level of familiarity, of course, I heard this piece on recordings several times. Right, that's I kind of know this piece, and then of course there is this piece that I've never heard about, <clears throat> and how do I comment? And how do I choose the winner? So um, we kind of refer to the text, right? If I see a fortissimo in measure 137 in a piece that I've never played or heard or taught, the, uh, but the person missed the culmination, okay, I will comment on that, all right? Um, if I see a variety of dynamics or tempo changes and in this piece and nothing happens, then I can comment. But, you know, the, and, you know, in some ways, being not familiar with the piece, it can be a good thing because you have this totally fresh look at the page. Where is forte? Where is piano? Where is culmination? Where is melody? Where are the changes? And and so you become kind of a mirror what you hear and you give feedback in, in a way it can be easy um it's harder when the person play you know it's a you know it's a, when you have to make a decision suddenly who is the winner commenting on a piece that is not familiar to me is relatively easy um, but then deciding was that a spectacular performance? Is, and comparing it with others and choosing the winner, that is where it becomes harder when the pieces are not that known. Well, decisions are made by voting. The point system that happens in international competitions can be a little tricky because uh, you can do all kinds of things with numbers. And, you know, uh, in order to lower an average, Right? You can use an extra low number to eliminate someone. So the current practice, for example, with the most recent Chopin competition was to publish all numbers of all judges, how they voted. And so you can uh, really follow their thinking. And so that's, you know, yes, there were situations in some competitions where, you know, you are expected to write the point and number, let's say from one to 10, I vote for this person is number seven. And then someone takes all these votes and they disappear with some kind of lawyer to some kind of room and they count and they suddenly you get results and you just don't see your vote in these results. It can happen that way too. So counting points is a very complicated kind of procedure that we should kind of get interested. How does the voting really happen? Um, <clears throat> normally in the MTNA, it is a majority vote. That's why we don't have an even number of judges, always three or five. And um, if there is a total disagreement, then the discussion happens at the end. Um, okay, so let's move on to, okay. Um, well, yes, yeah, so these are the typical issues for judges. Should the difficulty of the repertoire be a consideration, right? Um, and um, um, we, we, let's say we have a group of 14 year olds and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is, uh, there are some people play difficult music, some people play easier music, and but the ones that play it easier, they actually make more music. So, um, so occasionally, if I'm the only judge, I like to give it to give a signal to the broad audience that, that yes, the easier music, if it's really well played, it should be awarded a prize. There is no question that we are 
not after the difficulty of the repertoire, we are after the quality of the performance. Um, the next topic here, should judges simply promote their own likes in regard to style um, and interpretation, or should they be open-minded? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think I've noticed about myself when I was younger, I, um, I had this mission. I have to promote my teacher's ideas, right? This kind of thing. And I felt really strongly about that. And um, I'm on a mission. I represent a school from a certain part of the world and so on and so on and so on. Uh, but now I, I've noticed after the pandemic that I'm a different person. I'm very open-minded as long as you have ideas that work, that make sense. Um, I'm kind of like more the variety of interpretation, you know, Bach with pedal, Bach without pedal. Oh, let's have them both. I like them. You know, that's my, this is new me. <laughs> so, but it is a topic. Uh, what is the job of the judge really? Um, um, well, you know, the simplest description of the, of the um, duties of the judge is to give specific comments while perform because what we actually teach most of you know that's one of our mission is well we have to look at the page we have to honor the composer's intentions we have to ask the questions what did the composer want by writing this or that we have to respect every single sign because most of our composers were geniuses and uh, so the simplest description would be, I just look at the page and, um, and um, give feedback. Your performance versus the text. Okay, that's one possible um, uh, solution, you know, and, and people like it. You know, when you were telling your student that in measure 27, there is staccato, and uh, for, you know, the fifth lesson and the sixth lesson, nothing happens, and they go to auditions and they get a comment in measure 26, you missed staccato. That's a very useful situation, and we are very happy to hear comments and read comments that match our own comments. So that, that is a one way for judges to, um, to be uh, basically to maintain a professional standard. Okay. Well, but of course, judging is very tricky. What about the student who plays everything perfectly, but all of the ornaments seem incorrect? And you know, and, you know ornaments are, are such personal choice. And, you know, some teachers can be very creative with ornaments. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, there are many schools of playing ornaments. There's a chance that the teacher knows something. They have read some article recently that I have not yet seen. Am I the authority on ornaments? Right. So, <laughs> and you know, and th these are all the thoughts that happen while the student is playing. Right. So you have to come, keep commenting on what's happening. But you know, you have this issue. All the ornaments seem to be wrong from the wrong note. Uh, from the main now, this will be the upper name. You know, we have certain rules that we follow. Um, and how do you then award the prize? Do you give a prize to someone who plays wrong ornaments? No, well, even though they are so musical and they have such a beautiful style, very big issue, right? So we are, um, um, and you know, another situation, a perfect Mozart, perfect list. Horrible doctor. Okay, yeah, well, I'm just, you know, uh, make, make, you know, making it up at the moment, but it happens that uh, maybe that last piece was given to the student too late. All right? It's, it's not a question of the person not understanding the style. Oh, they realized it was 20 minutes and they only had 14 minutes, and those the, the three weeks before the application deadline, they added the doctor. So, um, in, in cases where one piece is excellent, I always give honorable mention. 
Okay, even even if the other pieces were really bad, but for that one musical moment that makes my day, and you know, this person really stands out uh, from the crowd, you know, especially at, I've seen lots of um, teenagers, you know, that take lessons and they're not quite sure if they really want to. Uh, and you know, that sonata really is. Uh, they don't like this one. But suddenly there's the Chopin option that speaks to this person. And you have this amazing music for five minutes, while there's the, what they signal is the total in, lack of interest in Bach or understanding of Mozart. But still, somewhere there they are a musician and they really communicated that musicianship. I always would give an honorable mention to that student. This is not to encourage you know, to, to, that they play other pieces badly. I use it. I am really critical and really harsh about the other pieces. I just they get the message, right? Um, right. And, you know, <clears throat> the next point. Should a talented student playing with great charisma and beautiful sound be penalized for the teacher's interpretative decisions? And, you know, um, I should, I should say for the teachers wrong interpretative decisions, you know. Um, and so um, this is tricky, you know. Um, I would not comment on the teacher, I would comment on the decisions, okay? Entirely on the decisions, uh, maybe um, um, not so much rubato. Uh, uh, in your Mozart sonata every second, you know, but very specifically, so that um, the student will ask questions to their teacher. Why did you tell me to slow down every two measures? <laughs> okay, and so this is now between them. Okay, I, I'm not pointing fingers because who knows? Maybe it was the other way. Maybe the teacher was begging the student to play in tempo, and the student is making the rubato in Mozart every two measures. I don't know. Maybe, right? But sometimes, like these ornaments, they can be decisions that you know the teacher told them to do this a certain way. But still, um, you just um, really don't know. You comment about the interpretation, not about the teaching. Okay? Um, right. Well, you know, we enter in the topic of mistakes. Are mistakes okay during a competition? Right? And so there, there were papers written about, you know, and which mistakes are okay and which mistakes are not okay. Um, so <clears throat> let's say you have the um, opening statement of the Chopin sonata in B minor, and instead of F sharp, you play F natural. Well, that does bother. You know, there's in the subjects, in the main melodic statements, there should not be mistakes, hesitations, wrong notes, because that really obstructs the listener's perspective. If you miss a small note somewhere in the fast passage in the Rondo Capriccioso, but your tempo and liveliness and you know, articulation, um, everything is great, we will certainly even forget about this. You know, sometimes you discuss with other judges and say, there was a wrong note there. I'm like, yeah, I forgot already. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> um, but the actual question is, um, is the solid performance, no mistakes to be awarded, or are we going more into the inspired performer who has some wrong notes? That's kind of tricky. And, you know, some judges are very, you know, kind of severe in that sense, wrong notes. You cannot be the winner. And I, I try to tell it to my students that, that this is the real judge, you know, if you have, because I want them to correct the wrong notes and, and prepare for a perfect performance. And of course, this is the, we know, there is no such thing as perfect performance. There will always be a mistake somewhere, <clears throat> some note that didn't sound, but we should aim at the performance without a mistake. And, you know, so, you know, so I cannot be 
encouraging or just be inspired and you'll be fine even though you'll be making mistakes. No, we are preparing for a competition, okay? Um, uh, where are we here? Well, you know, um, this is a serious topic and it has it's been changing. You know, I think people are aware of that, that uh, more and more, that if you are aiming to win a competition or you really not you're not there just to get feedback, then you should be using the best edition available. Okay, but however, it kind of um, now you know when students come and you've been given the music and you see the Shermer edition for 495 or the Chopin Nocturne and the Bach with all the pedals. Um, can you penalize the student for not being able to afford the $80 box and Beethoven's? And this is actually a very serious issue. So let's say the person is playing from an edition that we consider today actually a wrong edition wrong but they are following what they have on the page so how do we now communicate that's what's on the page is not actually right this is a very complicated topic and many sides to it the economics of it right that's one thing um then the students actually did their job and the teacher they were following the page except the page is not the page from which we all want to be learning today. Okay, so um, um, definitely in, co in the comments, we can encourage students to get a better edition. And there are ways to get a better edition without necessarily purchasing the book, right? You can, for example, become a member of your uni local university library that's about $20 a year, you can have access to a great library that has everything. And very often we're not aware of that um, because we think, oh, the university library is only for students and faculty. It's not. For a small fee, you get access to a great library. That's one way to deal with this issue, which is a real issue. But then it also, uh, it's connected with another issue. Um, when you are just about to perform at the competition, don't give the judge a different book than the one from which you were learning, because that happens quite often. Because the book from which we are learning is all full of comments and, you know, pencil markings, colors, exclamation marks, and words and stuff. So we sometimes reach for the nearest clean copy and give it to the judge. But we are not aware that the clean copy has different dynamics, different articulation. So in a way, we just, you know, people are affected from what they see. Okay, oh, well, why is he playing piano? It says forte. Why did he just give me the book that says forte where he is playing piano? I feel that is, okay. so make sure that the book that you bring the competition is the same edition that you've been you know, working with, because otherwise you basically are confusing the, you know, the situation. And um, we assume that the books that you brought are the books that, oh, this is what I've been learning. But sometimes, you know, they bring a different edition and it causes, especially with Bach, and it causes issues. Um, well, corruption, you know, there have been speculations about uh, in the big competition like Tchaikovsky and Leeds and you know just even two days ago there was a, this small competition in Bratislava in Slovakia the Hummel competition and there was you know the, 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 the main judges students won you know so it's kind of people co comment on that and the last actually the preceding month, because now we are in December, this was in October, the Chopin competition. Um, I, you know, most of the winners are students of the judges, but the judges are really good teachers, you know, so it's a kind of a problem. But when that happens too often, we become suspicious. 
Okay, and so um, a small issue is uh, with um, um, countries, and for many countries, cultural politics is important, you know, and many judges would be given uh, state awards from country A or country B, and later, two weeks later, they find themselves in an international competition voting for people from different countries. And you know, so that it can be a tricky when uh, you look at how the person voted, the person really supports Giannis from a country C or D, but they've gotten two medals from that government about a month ago. It happens. So I'm kind of, uh, well, but I think most people are very honest, but there are some dishonest people. That's what we, that's the best we can do, just to be aware of, you know, some things that can potentially be happening. Okay, <clears throat> what else do we have here? <clears throat> okay, the process of judging is um, very stressful because um, there is basically not enough time to write, uh, especially with pieces that we know and, uh, and uh, when we become too much of a, oh, we said, I have so much, so much advice for this student. And so we have to work out a system, how, how to comment and what not to comment on because there is not enough time. Okay, so um, the biggest issue, of course, is writing quickly, but, so, but also in a way that the teachers, then they actually able to read the comments. That's really important. I know sometimes and very often we are trying to uh, use as few words to say as much as possible, and that can lead to uh, kind of a mm, gibberish because there is no verb in the statement, right? So um, um, it's really that. So this is all kind of uh, stressful, and of course when the competition is you know for small kids, you know when you have forty of them in one hour. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> that is um, um, remembering 40 performances and then deciding who are the five winners. Uh, this and you know, they all six, seven year old, they played a little Bach minuet. And um, so, um, as soon as possible, I would come up for myself with some kind of a numbering system. You know, this person, let's say, from one to 20. This person is 16, this person is 12, this person is 7. Um, <clears throat> we don't know their names, we only have a number. Um, so organizational matters, where do I keep the sheets for people who just played and where are the new ones? And they have to be in, or, or in order. I usually tend to use the last minutes before the competition to sign everything because signing also takes time and I won't have time for that. Um, um, okay, that's the reality now, the concert reality. It takes a while for the judges to learn the particular instrument. And it very often, well, not very often, but it happens. You arrive at the hall and the first person is playing really loudly. And so you spend time commenting, why are you playing so loudly? There should be some piano here, you know, what happened to your piano? Everything is loud. By the time the third person plays, you understand that this is a very, very loud room. Uh, well, too late now. <laughs> right? So by the time the fifth person plays, you actually understand the instrument and the whole. And um, so um, what it means that it's likely better to play in a competition later in the day than at the beginning. And we also, that's just human nature, we tend to not remember the first people and not only, not because we don't remember them, it's exactly because the standard was not yet quite clear. That's why we don't remember them uh, very well, because at that time that person played well, but we did not know if this is the upper end of the spectrum or in the average. So, hmm, 
tricky. It's just, uh, um, you know, and research has been done on this, and there's a research on every single thing I'm telling you here, actually, uh, that the um, <clears throat> final participants tend to win. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just a moment. Um, <clears throat> important uh, moment is very often it happens, oh, now you can talk to the judges. And after being in a kind of a dark room for um, four hours, um, I don't remember the people. I, I don't, I, you know, for that particular performer, the 20 minutes of the day was the highlight of the day. And so they really were focusing. I, I have and 15 people played, and I really don't know. This person played ballad, this person played the nocturne. This person. And so this is kind of tricky. I tend to write down you know, what they're wearing. A boy in a red sweater. Okay, so later when the boy in the red sweater shows up with the teacher, I'm, ah, okay, that is the Haydn Sonata. Because it's just um, difficult. Um, sometimes um, the conversations can lead to uh, misunderstandings. Let's say, um, uh, I'll say, the student played really well, and I like the student playing, and I can say, I really like your playing. And, and that is taken by the teacher as a proof that I voted for the student. It's not. So the teacher said, he voted for my student. You know, and I was really embarrassed. I did not vote for that student because I like the student playing. However, there were better students. Okay, so <laughs> I haven't finished yet my, giving my feedback. But um, so, um, uh, okay, anything here that I have missed? No. Okay, let's see. I don't quite know how many. Okay. Well, you know, so then there's another aspect of competitions. How do we prepare? What to think about? Um, and, you know, attractiveness and variety in the repertoire, uh, um, it's, it's the key, you know, as pieces that work well together, I think, you know, at that kind of a high school college level. Um, something that shows the performer from all sides. If if all three pieces consist of staccato, then we would be like, well, I don't know how this person is, plays, you know, lyrical melodies, and uh, so uh, with lots of feeling. So um, we and so so many aspects here. Also, your student has to like these pieces because you know, like um, if if you are preparing them to win, right? Because sometimes we send students just to uh, hear another person's opinion, which is just fine. Um, uh, one way of standing out is to include that one piece by a lesser known composer. And so this way is like, oh yeah, but that um, piece, oh, I really remember the student because they, I, part of the judges um, kind of being part of an award of being a judge is I'm learning new repertoire every time I judge somewhere I write down on the side oh yeah these variations by Kabalevsky I haven't taught these so I bring lots of new pieces to Kansas with me so that's one way for the students to stand out you know to prepare something that is effective and it shows uh, you know, it, it's basically, well, they will be remembered. Okay, we already talked about the, you know, judges that look for perfection. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, there is also one thing that happens, a memory problem. Okay, is memory problem an acceptable, uh, acceptable thing in a competition, you know, and, and um, if this is a concerto competition, I, I would always say it's not acceptable because we have the responsibility of selecting someone who is solid. You don't want to give a gift to the conductor and to the orchestra of a person who will have a memory problem. So that's one category of competitions 
that I would not uh, accept a winner that had a memory problem. Um, okay, we already talked about many things here. Dog nodes. Um, however, uh, the, the, there was a situation a few years ago when uh, there was a, a, a problem with organization. The student had to wait. Let's say the student was scheduled for 11 a.m., but there were um, sheets missing and, and stuff like this. And, um, and that student was delayed by at least 15 minutes. And then they played excellently, but then they had a big memory problem. Okay. And, you know, I forgot about this. And, you know, my, and uh, this was an important competition. And so I kind of did not think about this student as a winner, but my colleague, spoke up and she said this student is excellent and should be not penalized for being delayed for 15 minutes imagine the person was already at the piano and was told but we don't have sheets for you we need to call the organizer what's going on or um, i don't really remember exactly was it the wrong um, wrong person so, so this person was told to leave the stage wait for as long as it takes to figure this out and then told to play um so my colleague was right the memory problem was caused by us and so i changed my vote and so i uh, think with memory can be tricky uh, yes i think it takes you know when you enter you should say hello why not <laughs> say thank you uh, don't be awkward with judges okay of course, another big topic here are online competitions. Uh, were they substitute for live competitions? I don't think so. You know, um, I think um, the art is about exactly playing live in front of people. But online competitions are always good for something, for getting feedback. All right, if, um, you know, and online competitions are relatively easy to organize. And you can have judges from Japan and China and from Australia. And that is the great thing. And you get feedback from 10 countries, different continents. So maybe that's the value. But uh, they're not the substitute for the real competition, right? Because uh, we all value that mental state and openness that comes with, I sit down, there's the keyboard and see what happens now. Can I be creative and, and perfect as much as possible at that given moment? So um, I'm kind of uh, skeptical. It, what, there's, there is a lot of to talk about online competitions and you know video submissions. That's another, another issue with economics. You know, your technology, your access to a good instrument, your access to a hall with good acoustics. Um, and the how many times would you like to try? Three times, four times, try it again next day. Right? So, um, <clears throat> so some people would spend um, days getting the perfect take. And then that recording can be used in many competitions. Is that a good thing? Again, uh, it's a completely different animal in that sense. You know, online competitions use the same recording for many competitions. Um, well, okay. Okay, benefits. Um, well, deadlines are good. <laughs> That's the other way of looking at it. Because without a deadline, we can work on this sonata for two years, but you have to be ready for November 5th, okay, and that actually is a part of the reality, what happens in music. We would be, you know, all Marta RH if not for deadlines. Well, because <laughs> by October 13, I can only play this sonata so well. But if you give me five years, I'll become Marta RH. Well, it doesn't work that way. So deadlines are good and deadlines, are, it's a transferable skill if you, the student is taught to be ready by a certain date. And that happens with different fields, with math, with physics, with history, they have to be ready for a test. 
So um, much of what we do is preparation for real life in different aspects of life. Okay, performing under pressure, pressure skill, right? Because um, 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 and, and you know, even for students who don't like it, oh, why don't you just try it? You know, uh, because you might discover it's not so bad at all. It's all in your head. You haven't tried it. You will actually never know. Is this really that bad? You know, so, um, well, with the deadline in mind, we have to be very strategic, strategizing and goal-oriented practice. You know, immediately how that deadline, um, you know, makes the lesson more organized, oh my, we have only one month before the audition and you haven't memorized it yet. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, next week, it has, so how, um, you know, having the deadline of the competition helps us in organizing our thought. What, and also, you know, there's this, this famous book by um, uh, Heinrich Neuhaus, the famous teacher from Moscow, conservatory he wrote the, the book about teaching and playing the piano and he and his definition about mastery was uh, how to use the least amount of time to play masterfully it's a very interesting definition i did not expect that but actually it's true how do we achieve something and how do we communicate and how do we teach in a way that also saves lots of time and gets us as to the goal as quickly as possible so that we can actually raise the level even higher right so so that's a tremendous benefit of having the deadline well learning from failure you know and there were i was judging uh, uh the competition maybe a year ago and you know um many many um many students are expecting to be number one and if you are number two that's a failure so that we have to address that and you know even in the kind of alternate or second prize third prize is not acceptable for many students oh it's kind of uh we really have to address this <laughs> there's only one first prize right and so I saw when the results were announced, they say this person second prize, and I saw this tremendous disappointment. And I was, but this is the second prize in the competition. I mean, it should be very happy. But so there is a certain mentality. Mentality: if you're not number one, you are a failure. No, we should we should think about this, and um, we should talk to students in advance of competitions to actually get them get them prepared for a possibility of failure you know sometimes when they don't play very well they understand oh it was a bad day i did not play well and so you don't need that but sometimes they feel i did well why am, am i not a winner okay so that comes to uh, another topic which is uh, i think competitions are there for us to be there and listen to them this is one thing that is missing you know only judges all the students maybe a parent and then the results are announced because we are also busy but actually to be there and to understand why the judges have chosen this person but not the other person it kind of and it's not only for us as teachers, but for the students to understand why this person was chosen as a winner, because they heard this person and they know how much better that person played. So, um, well, we all, yes, listen, meet the students and even talk to the teachers and the students, right? Um, oh, this is, a, in that way, a fantastic self-assessment tool if I told, if I taught this student and I thought I did my best and this student is a winner or second prize or anything, honorable mention, that actually is a recognition and that uh, gives us energy to continue, right? Um, but this idea of 
um, I think the uh, and it's so it's, it's everywhere in every state. People drive two hours or three hours to perform in a competition. They only enter the room for their child and their students to when they play, and then they leave. It shouldn't be like this. We should all sit there, make it a real musical event, right? And or then we understand. Oh, that student was really spectacular, and they got the first prize. And then we understand not only, you know, I'm too busy to go there. You text me about the results, and, and I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm also very busy, and I wish I could listen to the other students. Um, well, one thing you know to address this with your students is, oh no, I don't want to do a competition. No, no, no is that it is a necessary ingredient in today's world okay and i use it as well you know you will be ready for your jury a month before your jury <laughs> which is a great thing for me it, it moves for college level it moves the deadline by a month which gives you another month to either learn something new or um Perfect, some things that still did, are not working out. Um, working, strategizing, planning. Okay, I don't know if there is any more here. No, that is my school and uh, where I work. So uh, now I think it's time for questions. You know, there were so many aspects of this uh, lecture that uh, I'm sure you have questions. Okay, so I will stop the share. Okay, here we are. Do you have any question? Uh, I do. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for bringing up these uh, wonderful ideas. And I'm just typing away over here all of these thoughts. And I, I love hearing from other teachers and um, judges and just to kind of see what the insight is. And so thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your uh, experience. Uh, I was interested about, um, and there's several comments, but I'll just open it up. Uh, I was interested with the comment about student scores because that is a real issue. And um, I've studied with several teachers. One teacher I had uh, in graduate school really didn't care what score we use if it was 50 years old or if it was the you know right. hottest thing off the block it was just whatever we wanted as a student well i came from an undergraduate teacher who was very serious about it needs to be up to date what is the most scholarly the most you know researched and so it was just like a shock to me um and so i've kind of carried that over into my teaching where i, I want to stay on the cusp as much as possible and be sure that it's credible sources um right. And not something from 1952. You know, so um, I, I find that really interesting because you do see that as a judge in different situations. And sometimes it's the student's choice where they have chosen that music and you're, you know, how do you comment on that? Um, but on, on the other hand, sometimes I think it's the teacher's choice. I've had transfer students come to me with some of those really old Shermer editions, you know, and it's like, how do you gracefully say maybe we should update, you know? So um, I just wanted to see if anybody else had any thoughts or comments. I've, I've tried both sides of the, the system with that and I've experienced it. So it, it is kind of tricky. Um, I mean, in the judging aspect, you don't, I don't feel like you can really judge against a student for that because it's not, I don't feel it's the student's fault, you know? Um, but, and I never want to judge against a student for that reason, but uh, it definitely is an issue that I've encountered. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, you know, when I um, first moved to Kansas State, um, my students had all kinds of additions and, uh, and I, you know, I was difficult for me to enforce the good additions until I had a major artist give a master class and uh, uh, I'm glad it happened early in my career because he gave the master class and said what kind of university it is when you use these bad editions and that was the end of it and from that day onwards <laughs> we all use good editions and so that was the end of that topic for me and i also like um and i um 
what I do is, of course, I have my own copy, they have, have their own copy, and it has to be the same edition, so that we look at the same page, at the same measure, it's like, not like, why, the, why this is forte, but I have piano, no, well, this is a waste of time, in the lesson, right, we have to be looking at the same thing, plus, you know, um, the fingering, uh, why are you using these strange fingers, and, uh, and, well, because they practiced and they did the fingers that are on the page. But with fingering is a big issue. You know, the editors have different kind of hands, sometimes small hands, sometimes huge hands. Mm -hmm. um, we just, um, I was just criticizing a student for using this four, this third finger over four. And I was like, we don't do this on the piano. How did you come up with this idea? And they showed me it's in an edition. It's that fingering was actually written by Mary Pariah himself. Okay, so I was saying, oh well, Mary Pariah wants us to smile. <laughs> 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 I guess that's all. But we really don't play, you know, um, third finger over the fourth finger in reality very often. Maybe somewhere there's an exception. I'm sure. So. <clears throat> yeah. Um, is there any question? Everybody's quiet today, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was interesting about judging um, for competition and uh, the organizers not being as familiar with the rules as you were being the judge. And you know, that really, that really does happen and it puts you in this awkward situation of, you know, you don't want to be the problem child of the judging panel. Um, but yeah, I just, I thought that was fun. I wonder if anybody else had run into that that's listening today, if, if you had any issues being the judge or maybe on the receiving end of a judge's comments or something. And it was like, wait, this wasn't even a requirement. This wasn't even a rule. How are we getting judged by this? Has anybody had that experience before? Well, um, I think that uh, uh, when a problem arises, you know, uh, suddenly the, the organizer is supposed to have it, we expect, you know, this and sometimes it ends up being, oh, let me check, you know, and looking and, 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 and you know, the, there are people waiting for the results and mm -hmm. so it can be very stressful uh, for the, especially if you have an uneven number of judges and every judge has a different opinion about the winner, for example. And so that's kind of things. Um, so that happens occasionally, but, but not too often, not too often. Yeah. I think that um, sometimes the rules can be too complicated because uh, the person who writes the rules, of course, the fairness is very important. So, mm -hmm. but how to do it so it's accessible, easy to understand and quick. However, also, of course, fair. Mm -hmm. So that, can, that is a complicated job. So. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there any question or? Oh, yes. I liked it when uh, you spoke about, uh, you know, my, most of my students are, are not advanced. So, but I've had, uh, I've had one student, this one time I've had a student who, who won a um, honorable mention um, and he played music that was not especially hard compared to the other, mm -hmm. other um, contest, contestants. Um, this was, you know, uh, in the younger field. And so I, but he played it very well. I always enjoyed it when he played it. It was very musical. And so I, I appreciated you speaking on um, the uh, judging a student for playing well, maybe slightly easier. That is a that is a tough one wow. to navigate. I have to say because certainly the virtuosity or you know the, the hardness of the uh, the difficulty of the repertoire is certainly you know something to be considered but then how well they play it as and then you know that also comes into how as teachers we we assign um the literature to their strengths 
So, I mean, I really appreciated you touching on that and speaking on that because mm -hmm. I, my students um, are not advanced yet. They're, some of them are beginning to get that way, but mine are mostly uh, elementary. Well, I think that, you know, sometimes the, the college um, professors, um, they might uh, kind of, uh, there's one avenue that they can, the mind goes into, which is college auditions. Which out of the students will be the future professional pianist? But I don't think necessarily that this is always the topic of that competition. The topic is this person is not going to be a pianist. This person will be someone else. What is music important to them? Are they making music at this moment? So that should be awarded. And, you know, so this is a different uh, line of thinking. But very often we kind of think, oh, this is, this is a future pianist and they might not be playing too well, but I, this is certainly. <laughs> and that one, no, the, the people who make music today at this given moment should be recognized. So that's mm -hmm. it's a difficult topic too. Yeah. Yes, yes. I was given some advice um, as a starting out as a judge that you should, if you have the opportunity, when you go into the recital hall or whatever room that's being used, that you sit down yourself and play something, whether it's a scale or, you know, a, a, something to try out the different ranges of the piano. And I was thinking about that when you were saying, you know, just getting used to the room and listening only, you kind of, wow, you have no idea. Like you said, until four or five students said, wow, the bass is really heavy on this particular grand piano. And they could be playing as light as a feather and somehow it still just sounds like fortissimo. So, um, that came to mind because, you know, like you said, sometimes it's, it does feel a little bit uneven as a judge because you don't know the acoustics in the room and all of that. Right. Um, and sometimes you just walked in, boom, the student's already there when you arrive. So there's not a whole lot you can do. But on the occasions that you can, um, I think that's kind of was where perhaps you were leading with that um, to, to try to be more equitable with the judging. Well, yes, there were some, if, you know, it's all all over the place. Some places they say, yes, you, know, you should allow the student to warm up. And so you tell the student, oh, why don't you just try the piano a little bit, the keyboard, and usually they play a scale and you know, try something. But then there was some other competition. I was told the students are allowed to warm up a little bit, but they are not allowed to try any part of the, of the repertoire. So how do you enforce that? You can warm up, but don't you try your Mozart sonata? You know, that's a very complicated thing to co to communicate, especially when you have like twelve performers. When you're warming up, do not use your repertoire to for warm up. Um, that was a difficult rule to enforce. Yes. Absolutely. So actually, I. And my students played at the competition last fall in Las Vegas because I'm teaching online. Uh huh. And then my student played at the competition, and he was a first player, first performer. Mm. But I don't know why that happened. But the pedal was not working. The pedal. Yes. Oh. Oh. Oh my gosh! But he was a first performer. Oh. So Georgie didn't know, Georgie's didn't didn't know pedal. Oh, yeah. So he yeah. played really well, but the piece is yeah, if there is no pedal, the piece, the the music is yeah. Well yeah. Is, yeah. So yeah, it was so sad. <laughs> but, um, hmm. Well, uh it's hard to say, you know, from a young person's perspective, but normally the person should get up and inform the judges, I'm sorry, the pedal is not working. You, and you know, this is, I know, it's hard to right, be in a state of mind where you are being tested to actually communicate that the, the, the machinery is not in order. Right? So, but yes, there were, um, um, there are issues with pedal, particularly with pedal noises. Yeah. You know, sometimes it, when when the person plays, the pedal becomes noisy, like like a knocking sound. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, when so 
Well, it shouldn't be happening. So first, as, as the person is hitting, it's a possibility. The person hits the pedal very strongly with the shoe. So, but then you have the three other people and the same thing happens. So finally, you think something is wrong with the pedal. It's a real issue. Uh, but yes, we should definitely watch at, during our lessons if the pedal is not too noisy. Yeah. So that's a, uh, mm. and you know, the person can be so busy making music, they don't even hear that the pedal, there's some issue with the pedal. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yes, after four people's pedal was noisy, we actually called mm -hmm. the organizer and asked them to check the pedal. And mm -hmm. yes, it was noisy, so we had to call the tuner. And, so that things like that happened, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after he's playing, so after he's playing, so he told them uh, the pedal was not working. So ah, he started. did. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Oh. But but he 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 wasn't able to play again. He was not. <laughs> no, right. no. That is a no. problem. Yeah. He should be allowed to play again. Yeah. Huh. Well. Um. And of course, this is an issue if you know how long do they have the hall? Is there a choir meeting there at 5 p.m.? And they have to, yeah, you know, it's just, yeah, that's just reality of our life. So, yeah. I had a recent situation with the competition um, where the student, I wasn't, you know, obviously I'm not allowed to be in the room, but the student said that the judge stopped them in the middle of playing and opened up the piano and started working inside and there's something wrong and the student oh. didn't know that anything like they they could it was oh. a young student a child but um they just they didn't know all that they were just complete like into their music and then they open the piano and start to mess with the strings and this isn't right and 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 then like try to go back and play again and the student was like i was so just distracted <laughs> and just out of my focus that and i don't think they received a very good grading oh. or not as high as i really hoped they would have and I'm like, well, that's that's one of those things, like you said, it's a learning experience. <laughs> I would I would yeah. hope the judge would would not do something like that. But I think it's good for the students to learn that, of course, you want to do your best. Of course, you want the best circumstances. But it's a good life lesson, I think, in what you're saying it was one of your main points. You know, stuff happens in life. Um, yes. I was playing a, a hearing for a recital. And the chapel, and boom, the doors swing open, and here's two guys in coveralls. Hey, Bob, we gotta fix the air conditioner. Oh. You're playing by memory, 20th century music, going, dear God Almighty, does, could this be another time besides right now? Oh. So it's you know, it's it's real life experiences. So I just try to chalk it up to that with my students. I commiserate, but I go, you know, sometimes it's the luck of the draw, and you never know. I mean, it may have oh. something that was really obvious, and the judge was really frustrated and just felt it was important to stop the student, but on the student side, uh, she was rather gotten off with, you know, just, it didn't feel respectful because she was right in the middle of playing, but um, there's two sides to every story I know, so. Well, my, anyway, I my um, kind of most memorable experience as a judge was um, a competition um, in which they played two pieces, I think 13 minutes or something like that, and they choose their first piece. Okay, so, and this is the last performer. Okay, so that person starts with, they select their first piece, I don't know, list, rhapsody, something, something. Um, they play, and then um, they have a Beethoven last movement of, I, I remember that was the Waldstein. And, um, and they all expected to play 13 minutes. But, you know, they played so well, I'm like, oh, let them just play, you know, it's just such a great piece. I mean, how can I cut off the, you know, uh, coda? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as the clock was nearing the 13 minutes, after the 13th minute, the person started having serious memory problems. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, you know, so from playing really well, he was barely able to finish his piece because he timed it. They will stop me at the 13th minute. 
and that was a, big, a great lesson for him. I was, I, you know, he was uh, <laughs> very embarrassed. I was covering my face because it was so funny. But, <laughs> but I think he learned his lesson that you learn the entire piece. You don't mark in the score. Somewhere around here, the 13th minute will happen, and I don't need to care about the last two pages. It doesn't work like this. No. <laughs> anyway, so, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> my friend actually had a has a same same my <laughs> my friend actually did kind of that so well, i think it's done a lot because if you are in between performers then oh they will stop me around here and you know well, that's just human nature but i don't think it's a musical thing to do mm. somehow so we need to be aware anything can happen as we were just saying that you know the judges say, oh, this is so it played so well, and it's such so uh, such bad manners to interrupt. You know, let him play the additional, you know, to the end, and it can happen. So I would definitely advise learning the entire piece. You know, just <laughs> so yeah. So there's a, was an audition in the college audition. And the, yeah. the college the time limit was fifteen minutes, and she played Bach and. Uh -huh. Sonata number three, first movement. Okay. So it was about 13 minutes something. So two okay. minutes left. So she played only beginning of, she just practiced only beginning of the Chopin well, yeah. number four, only the beginning. Well, yeah, that happens, that happens, yes. that happens. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so. Um, Ah, it was really great presentation. Oh, yeah. Well, Thank my you. pleasure. Yes. Well, yeah. very informative. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Well, if you have any questions, you can always email me. You know, it's my first name at ksu.edu. And so mm -hmm. uh, I hope we'll keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's also recording. And, you know, so. You can always listen again and more questions will probably appear in you know, so yeah. yes so thank I you think... so much for coming today well my pleasure have a yes. great weekend yes have a good weekend <laughs> thank you thank you i hope all stay safe and because new virus virus covid virus is getting serious again so, there's all yes. kinds of confusing <laughs> news out there so we really yeah. don't so. Yeah, so stay safe and healthy. Stay home. Happy holidays. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.